This is Jay Martin. Thank you all for joining me up here today and cleaning up the show here. Uh, this has been one of the most highly anticipated features of the day, so I'm excited to jump into it. The topic is, where is the smart money going in 2023? And so, you know, we're not going to uh, begin with uh, the granular investment opportunities. I thought we should start super macro, right? Talk about any rotations and capital allocation that you're seeing at the highest levels, any changes in sentiment regarding capital allocation that you're seeing at the highest levels, and is there some kind of a rotation occurring right now in where big money will head this upcoming year? Anybody want to go first? Frank, can I call on you? Frank, Frank should go first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Um, well, listen, I just look at it from my own perspective. What I'm doing, I don't know what every, everybody else is doing, but um, I'm playing defense. And so we're in really unprecedented times. I'm not sure where things are going to end up. I have my own theories, but you know they're all probabilities. So um, now is not the time to have that motto of you know, you know, fortune favors the brave. That that old Matt Damon thing. Hmm. That that those days are over. I think right now be diversified um, asset classes geographically um, and have cash. Uh, put it in short-term T-bills. Have a lot of cash because. I think that these mo this bubble that just burst last year has a long way to go. So, um, and it's going to come in waves, much yeah. like it did in the 30s and the 70s. Hmm. And I think it's, uh, equities are going to have to come down a lot further. And so I think a lot of cash. Um, I'm a hard asset, uh, skewed hard assets. Um, I seeing stagflation for the next decade. So I want to be in hard assets like gold and commodities and real estate, and very select equities, not U.S. equities, I'm foreign. Um, I'm looking at the big metals producers, pay great dividends, um, although they're getting a little bit toppy now. Uh, Canadian preferreds, um, staying away from long bonds, staying on the short end of the yield market, and yeah, that's basically it for me. And I okay. think that we're going and just sit back because there will be opportunities. And often the best trade is patience. I love that. Okay, so we're playing defense, we're looking at hard assets, we're looking at cash, and we're waiting for opportunities. Uh, Grant, how about yourself? Yeah, I think, I think that's a fantastic way to put it. And I think anyone that listened to our panel this morning, this idea of being paid to wait finally and playing defense, as Frank puts it, which is a great way to think about it. Um, you know, for, for the longest time, uh, investors have kind of felt they were faced with two choices. Do I buy this, do I sell it? But there's a third choice which is so important, which is do I do nothing? Mm. And we're finally back at a point where it's okay to do nothing. You don't have to rush into things. I think patience is exactly right. Um, and this idea that uh, you need to have a cash reserve on hand, there are gonna be some tremendous opportunities, but if you're not liquid when those opportunities come along, and we had a perfect example of this in the UK a couple of months ago with the LDI, the liquidity driven investments. Um, where if you had cash and you were in those markets, you picked up bargains that you were done for the year. You had the one week where you were busy, you bought things that were money good, and you sat back. Same thing in Japan. You know, as, as the Bank of Japan has gotten squirrely, and when they moved that, that peg, it was, it was really, really cheap to buy downside optionality on the yen in front of every single Bank of Japan meeting. And if you were wrong, it cost you a few basis points. And then we had one meeting in December where you were right, and I know three or four guys with funds, that was their year done in one trade. They captured the upside of that, they shut the books down, that's it. And so I think we're moving into a world now where the smart money we're talking about is gonna be very selective about what they do, to Frank's point. They're gonna try and stay liquid, and they're gonna be very opportunistic. And that requires doing work so that you're ready to take advantage. And when something happens, you need to know, okay, this is something I wanna get involved in. But in the meantime, just be patient, be patient. And being patient is a major shift in mainstream investor psychology from what we've experienced over, I mean, I guess the last decade, that's what I can speak to, right? Uh, yeah, FOMO's we've, been the inspiration yeah, for most from, trades. We've gone from FOMO to FOSU, right? FOSU, fear of screwing up. That's, right. that's, that's what we've moved into now. Well, I hope so. Yeah, yeah I don't know if we're there, but I'm, I hope you're right. I think that will be a really healthy change. Um, Rick, how about yourself? Well, a lot of smart things have been said. Um, I'm not doing all of them, by the way. Uh, on the macro thing, 
the one thing I have to add is I think we're back into the 1970s for the long bond. I think there's going to be major disintermediation out of the long bonds. When the interest rate goes up, the capitalized values of distributions goes down at the same time as the yield is still negative. So if you're running a great big endowment, two ugly things have happened to you. If your portfolio is 60% bonds, you've experienced a real haircut on the long end of your portfolio. You have a funding crisis. At the same time that in terms of the purchasing power of the pensioner's assets that you hope to deliver in 20 years, you're unable to do it. So there's going to be disintermediation out of a long bond. I haven't had the guts to own the long bond for a very long time, but that's a different question. For my own portfolio, uh, I've been very, very long cash. Not really as a strategy, like Frank, but rather because I couldn't see the right opportunities to deploy it. I wanted to deploy it, but I didn't see enough opportunity for my <laughs> my greed to overcome my fear. I did a pretty good job in COVID of getting long the only COVID beneficiary that I could see, which was the oil and gas business, which has treated me extremely well. That trade feels to me like for somebody who was an early entrant like me, it's getting long of tooth. But for the rest of the world, when people talk about peak oil in 2030, they should be talking about 2045 or 2050. Two, the lack of sustaining capital investment in the oil business means that the oil price as a consequence of that will stay higher for longer. So I'm attracted to that. And the peripheral oil trade it attracts me. I'm in the insurance business personally. And when I watch the big insurance companies in the world walk away from oil and gas risk, I walk in. I'm celebrating retirement at age 70 by starting a new bank. Um, I'd like to control my own portfolio, my own bond portfolio, thank you. The covenants on Wall Street are atrocious. I'd like to do my own lending covenants. And, and the fact that the major banks in the world are walking away from the business that I know best, which is the oil and gas business, and allowing me to become a lender to the oil and gas business is like a dream come true. I'm also, different than Frank, uh, observing that most individual investors and institutional investors have a risk-off mindset. And so I'd like to take about 10% of my assets uh, and go very risky, which is to say private placements in companies with no visible means of repayment. Uh, fortunately for me, probably, the issuers uh, aren't seemingly to willing to sell me equity thus far <laughs> at a price that I'm willing to pay. So I've been inadvertently prudent. Now, I appreciate all those perspectives, and it relates perfectly to our theme this year up on the board this morning. We were talking about building a moat before you build a castle, and everybody on stage today has talked about patience and defense. I'd like to segue, therefore, into portfolio balance. Now, you mentioned, Rick, 10%, for example, you speculate with. It's easy to be patient if you know you're stable, if you have confidence that you can weather a storm. You know, this unraveling of the equities market will have ups and downs and there's more coming, right? So there's more crises likely in the future. It's easier to sit back and watch those occur from a place of confidence, knowing you've got whatever assets are required to weather the storm. So proper balance, right? That's the barbell approach. You were kind of hinting at that, Rick. It's the safe havens over here, and then a little bit of, of to quote Eric Sprott, wild ass speculations over here, right? Um, so expand on portfolio balance if you can. How do you manage that? I'll start again with you, Frank, and work back towards myself. I'm not a portfolio manager, but listen, I just look at my own situation. Like I said, I'm. I'm very bullish on gold, so my gold content is percentage-wise quite quite high because I believe that we're in the beginnings of a gold market. Um, but you know, I'm probably 30% cash, um, 20, 30% equities, gold, and a lot of real estate. You know, that's okay. just because that's the only that's the way I see it at the moment. Rick, uh, I also speculate. I have a small part of my portfolio where I where I take very risky shots because that's the business we're in and, um, you know, creating new companies, as you know. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that is a portion of my portfolio. I appreciate that. And just to, just to elaborate on a quote that, or 
something Frank said. Nothing up here, we're not giving, none of these gentlemen are giving investment advice. I've just asked them to come up here and talk about what they're doing with their cash. Uh, that's not directive in any sense, but thank you for sharing. Um, I have to ask Frank, when you say a lot of gold, um, can you add any kind of a percentage on that? Um, listen, I own physical. I think you have to distinguish between physical and paper gold. Yeah, okay. To me, paper gold is not gold. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons that I don't believe that the day, if the day comes when you really need that gold, whether it will be there if it's in the form of paper, uh, there are far too many claims on it. So no, I believe in physical gold. I think everybody should own physical gold. I just had a, I just gave my kids a gold coin each and gave them a very long lecture on why they should own, go, why they should own that gold so long that they almost gave me the gold back. Just to shut me up, but, uh, um, but no, but it's true. But I actually, I, I, I did it for a reason. I gave him one, uh, one, one coin each. I said, it's important to own the physical. I don't know if you uh, recall. Last year, they found uh, on a UK construction site, they found this stash of gold that was 250 years old. Well, those gold coins still have the same purchasing value today. You can buy a gentleman's fine suit with one ounce of gold. It was valid then, it's valid now. It's a store of value, but you have to own the physical. Grants, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think um, when we talk about portfolio allocation, this, it, it's a really kind of highfalutin term, or it's become a highfalutin term. The reality is, you know, everybody in this room, everyone that's thinking about how to, how to deploy their savings, whether they want to deploy them in the markets or just put it into something safe, like T-bills, as Frank was talking about earlier on, um, Everybody needs to start thinking about their risk tolerance, about the things that they believe in, the work they've done, the things they understand, because we've kind of outsourced a lot of this over the last couple of decades to, to managers. And people have kind of abdicated the responsibility for their, for their own investments because it's been kind of okay to do that. We've had these tailwinds everywhere you look, markets have gone up. This buy the dip mentality has worked, even if you didn't really know you were doing it, you just left your money in and then when markets have fallen, the Fed have ridden to the rescue and, and it's been okay. So when you think about how you allocate your portfolio today, I think you really need to, to start understanding yourselves. You need to understand what's my tolerance for risk, first of all, because I think the, the risk uh, environment has changed dramatically in the last year with, with the way inflation's happened and, and the knock-on effects of of the response to inflation has changed risk completely. And so if you were very comfortable just having your money in the market, I think that's potentially something you need to rethink. You need to th rethink what sectors of the market do I like? And once you get to the sectors of the market you like, uh, understand the companies you like. This is not uh, a, a kind of put all your money into the market and rely on all the boats to, or the tide to lift all the boats. I just don't think that's gonna work as well anymore. And so understanding the companies you own is going to become really, really important and not just putting your money into something and then letting it become orphaned. You need to follow the companies. You need to understand how the businesses are performing um, because being an investor for hundreds of years meant you were a stakeholder in a company. And we've gotten away from that in the last little while. You've become someone with chips on the table and it's really been little more than that. So I think the big change now is one in responsibility, where we all need to take responsibility for our capital. And if we don't feel comfortable allocating that capital ourselves, then we have to take responsibility for the choices we make in who we get to manage it for us. Um, and that starts with, as I say, understanding our own tolerance for risk. If you're not risk tolerant, and both Rick and Frank and I uh, are happy to speculate, but we do it in with money that I'm sure I could speak for these two guys, that if it goes to zero, we understand that's the risk and it's not gonna have a material effect on either our emotional well-being or our lifestyle. And that's really crucial to understand because in the last 10 years, people have been throwing stuff against the wall, throwing money at things like WeWork, which at the time seemed like a fantastic idea. And no matter how you break it apart, in, with the benefit of hindsight, it was ludicrous as were a lot of these companies. You know, the, the, the things that went up in COVID, like Zoom, you know, which is down 85%. Um, and you're not to pick on Kathy Wood, but the ARK Innovation Fund has you know, fallen 85% in the last year. Um, it's bounced now in the new year, but they kept having inflows. 
So that tells you the, the, the mindset of investors is technology is the future, I'm gonna throw money at it, the fact that this thing's gone down 85% is irrelevant to me, it's gonna bounce. And that's the mindset we have to get out of. So for me in portfolio allocation, take back control of it, understand it more yourselves, and the first thing to do is an audit of your own risk tolerance. And, and that, mindset, that mindset strikes me as a bunch of swing traders who are identifying as investors. Yeah, exactly. But right. they're not exactly the right. same thing. No, they're, they're, very, they're very different things. It's been fine to be a trader for the last 20 years because you've had trending. And when markets trend, you can trade them. But when you have volatility and you're an inexperienced trader, mm. I guarantee you, you will get kicked out at the wrong times, you'll buy at the wrong times, and it's, it's, it's the road to hell. Rick, anything to add on, on how you manage your portfolio to make sure you're equipped to deal with crises, but you still have stakes on the table for that potential 20 extra when it presents itself? Mercifully, for the last 30 years at least, I've tried to confine my things, my investments to things that I felt uh, I knew better than most other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I was less interested perhaps in the investment category than I was whether I had the confidence to invest in it. Uh, I wasn't <laughs> always so prudent. Hmm. And I just got tired of getting spanked. You know, I, I got tired of making mistakes that I didn't understand. And so I really want to know the investment thesis and I want to think that I myself have the expertise that I give a damn about what I think. Um, that's what I've tried to do. Uh, I've tried too, as I age, and I've gotten to know more people, to do business with more people that I already know and love and trust. My mistakes as a speculator have always come, every goddamn time, uh, with occasionally being tempted to do business with a punk. Uh, and I'm <laughs> just not gonna do that anymore. In terms of portfolio allocation, you know, Buffett says, put all your eggs in one basket and watch the basket. And right. I do believe myself in the value of concentration. I mean, you're sticking where you have a competitive advantage, right? That's, and it's, it's such a valid point to make. I mean, Frank describes himself as a competitor. Frank knows how to help high quality people build companies. His definition of a, of a speculation is to take a world-class guy and support him. That's a pretty special kind of speculation, one that most people don't know how to do and one that most people can't take advantage of. So when Frank describes himself as a speculator, what he's saying is that he employs process, prestige, and capital in a business that's highly speculative that he knows better than other people. That's the right kind of speculation. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> All true. Yeah, I appreciate your, your bill that. Is in the mail. And you know, you, you hit on something there, Rick, that I suppose I've learned from listening to you for the last decade. You know, when people ask me why I have no money in the broad equity sector, I say it's because I don't have a competitive advantage there, right? What do I know that the gentleman or, or lady next to me doesn't know, right? What's my competitive advantage? But I live and breathe in this industry, right? And so I can allocate capital here because I feel like if you're obsessing over something, you probably know maybe something the majority doesn't know. And so you play in your own sandbox. It's great advice. Jay, Jay, I want to comment on that actually. For younger people in the crowd, almost everybody in the crowd is younger than me, uh, but people your age, you know, I've watched you know, for 10 years, what you did was the best of all. You invested in yourself. You invested in your knowledge, you invested in process, you invested in acquiring mentors. And for most of the younger people in the audience, the best possible investment they can make is in their own education in developing discipline and developing processes. I mean, I just got done, you know, flattering Frank. So for you, your ability to build this conference, your ability to take over what your dad made and make it bigger, your stage presence, uh, you did exactly the right thing. And young people in the audience should emulate that. The first thing you invest in, the most important part of your portfolio is you. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, means the world. Um, well, hang on, Jay, Jay, say something nice about me. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, this guy, Grant no, I'm Williams. Kidding. I'm kidding. For, <laughs> for six years, I know you're lying now. For six years running, has been voted best speaker at my conference. I have nothing nice hey. to say about you. <laughs> all right, all right. I, I do want to pivot to the gold market a little bit because. Um, 
Uh, here's where we're at, right? Everybody on the stage right now is, is playing some version of defense, playing the patient game. And, you know, maybe it's my bias, but when I hear that conversation, I do gravitate towards the gold market because it, it demands patience. I tend to hold my savings in physical gold because I, I can't cash it out easily. It's my option on liquidity should I need it, but it's not cash in my account that I can spend like this should I feel inclined. So there's a barrier to entry there that has really served me, to be honest with you. Um, but anyways, all the way up the spectrum of capital right now, we're seeing an increased allocation to gold. Uh, central banks, institutions, it's not just retail investors like you and I. So what's changing in the gold story right now that is different from what we've seen over the previous decade? And Frank, I want to start with you. Central bank buying. Um, I've been watching this process for the last 12 years. And actually, I just uh, remember Grant interviewed me in 2016. And I watched this interview yesterday because I knew I was going to see Grant. And I was talking about the flow of gold from west to east and that it was going to China mostly and that eventually we were going to get a monetary system reset and it would have a gold component in it. That idea is gaining a lot of steam. And I don't know if you've watching carefully over the last while the conversations that are taking place. First of all, central banks' gold buying in the east and the global south is accelerating. Um, and there are conversations about moving away from the U.S. dollar. And those conversations are being uh, made by Russia, China, the BRICS, even the South America, Brazil and Argentina talked the other day about creating a, a, a zone currency for, for South America. There's all of these conversations about gold-backed rubles or a uh, gold-backed stable coin between Russia and Iran. This is happening because most countries are wanting to get away from the U.S. dollar for various reasons. Obviously, you have the Russias and the Chinas and the Irans, the Venezuelas that are wanting to get away with it because they're being sanctioned uh, or threats of sanction in, in the case of China if they ever do anything with Taiwan. Um, and uh, But the Global South has their own reasons. You know, they've been penalized by the U.S. dollar system for far too long and they've been held hostage. And... Everybody's looking for some new version of a global currency that will compete with the U.S. dollar. Not take, it o take over, but compete with it. And that, all the signs I am seeing with the fact that gold is moving in large quantities to the east and to the global south, and all of these conversations that are taking place, tells me that we're heading for, to a, a system reset and gold will play a role. And you can look at it in many different ways as a function, partial backed currencies based on M1 zero, uh, M0 uh, money supply, or there are other ways based on GDP and trade, but I think we're heading there. And I think there will be a revaluation of gold at some point mm. when that happens. So my attitude is I bought my gold over 20 years ago, I'm gonna hold it forever. Okay, or until the Tom Brady's and Kim Kardashians go on TV and tell you to buy gold and then sell it, okay? Um, but for now, hold it forever because it will have, it's going to play a role in the global monetary system. I have no doubt of that. I don't know what the timing of that is. That could take years or months, who knows? But uh, gold is definitely where everybody's heading. That's my main reason for holding it. Now, Grant, I know you spent a lot of time on this, and earlier today we were talking about exactly this on a different stage, and, and Ghana just accepted oil delivery in exchange for gold they produced, so they're, they're exercising exactly what Frank is talking about, finding a way to transact for a commodity the world needs without using U.S. dollars. So what are some other real-world examples that are occurring right now, just to add some activity to what Frank just shared? Excuse me. Um, well, I, th I think that what the world needs and has needed for some time is, is a neutral reserve asset. And gold provides that. It provides something that is independent of politics, of country. It's an inert rock, right? And so once you have uh, a neutral reserve asset that everyone can own and is not subject to the whims of politicians or treasury enforcement or any of these things, as Frank says, this has been happening for some considerable time now. And, and we're moving quicker and quicker. And that doesn't mean, as Frank says, it doesn't mean it's going to happen this year. It doesn't mean it's going to happen next year. What it means is it's become a priority for everyone to have a plan for when it does happen. 
and mm. when it happens, it's too late. You can't make your plan after that. So I, th so I think this, this central bank buying 55 tons in, in Q4 last year is, is very important. Um, but that was a headline. What has been going on for the last 10 years, very quietly, this has been happening all over the east, all over the south, these, these, these small countries that are irrelevant in many people's eyes. Oh, so what if the Philippines bought a load more gold? Right. Uh, it matters, right? Because they're diversifying out of dollars, they're building up their gold reserves. The Russians used to publish every month um, their gold reserves and it was just a 45 degree line going up. They've stopped publishing it now. The Chinese occasionally kind of throw the world a bone and it's always, yeah, we've got a load more gold. Um, Turkey, Indonesia, you can go through all these, <laughs> just about every country except Canada and the UK, as far as I can figure out. Um, but everybody is buying more gold for a reason. Um, it is becoming clearer that this reset that Frank just mentioned and a lot of people have talked about for many years is going to have to happen. It's not a choice. The world is not going to choose to reset. The reset's going to be forced upon us. And when that happens, uh, you will need a neutral reserve asset at the middle of it, even if we don't go back to a gold standard, but you need to stabilize the system when you create the new system. Something has to sit in the middle that you can stabilize the whole thing around, write the rules, write the conditions, write the exchanges, whatever it may be. And it's very hard for me to see past gold as that asset. The Bitcoin guys will argue that Bitcoin could play the role, and I understand why they would say that, but for me to be, let's say if this happens sometime in the next 10 years, to build a new reserve system around a 20 year old asset is not something I think people will do. So for me, I think that's, that's what's changed in gold and that's why the central banks are buying it because this reset is, is possibly gonna be forced upon them and they have to be ready when it does. Rick, any additional thoughts you'd share on that? The only additional thing I wanna say, and I agree with everything that's been said, um, as I understand it, uh, well, I don't understand it, J.P. Morgan Chase said that the market share of precious metals and precious metals related investments in the United States is less than one half of one percent, which is to say that the market share of the asset class is de minimis. The four decade mean market share is two percent. So if the weaponization of the dollar, disintermediation out of the bonds, the incredibly bad arithmetic of U.S. Treasury securities, which is a three and a half percent yield, in a currency declining by 7% compounded, gold doesn't have to win the war against the US dollar or the US treasuries. It just needs to lose less badly. My belief is that demand for gold or the market share of gold in the market I know best, the US market, will return to mean, which is to say it'll go from one half of 1% to 2%, which means that demand for precious metals and precious metals related securities will quadruple. Prices are set on the margin. <laughs> When I think about the quadrupling of demand and I think about the impact of supply, uh, the, pardon me, the impact on the float, on price and on supply, it's a pretty attractive circumstance. And if I'm wrong owning gold, at least I personally sleep nights and stay calm. Uh, right. Which at age 70 is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> at, at any age, I think. Um, and uh, okay, so if we end up in some kind of a scenario where there's an increased volume of transactions that are occurring backed by gold. Does that create an incentive for less predictable gold producing nations to nationalize their production? Because they're gonna say, look, this is a currency we need now. Um, turns out we have it, it's just in the ground. The investment's already been made over the last 15 years. We'll take that, we need that. Any thoughts? I, 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 think, I think the first step of that we've seen in Ghana uh, where the government have said, okay, you need to sell your gold to us. The Chinese do that, the Russians do that. No gold is sold uh, externally. Right now, that's done at market price. That may change. Right. What may change is they say, well, you're going to sell us all your gold and here's the price you're going to do it at. But yes. I think we're way away from that right now. But I could absolutely see a step where governments start to say, great, come mine the gold, but we want, we want to be the first to uh, offer and we'll take everything you've got. Mm. Rick, any thoughts? <laughs> Governments see their job as redistribution. Uh, so if you can't convince somebody voluntarily to give you the assets to redistribute, you have to steal it. That's the job of governments. Uh, certainly, they don't want to steal when there isn't much to steal. They wouldn't want to steal a, a business like the gold business in 2015, where they lose money every year. 
But a business where there's 50 or 60 percent operating margins, of course they're going to try and steal it. It's what they do for a living. Amen. Now, uh, you know, Frank has to be friends with the former speaker, so he can't follow on with stuff like that. But I. Um now, I'll play the naive one on the, on the stage right now, or the blind optimist. Would it not be an incredibly intelligent decision for a government like the government of Canada to say, you know, we, this is not going to happen, but maybe not Canada. There's, there's a better example than Canada, but for an intelligent, forward-thinking government to say, look, we see the opportunity here to complete commodity transactions in something other than U.S. dollars, backed by gold in some way, and the smartest thing we can do is simultaneously grow our economy and our gold output and uh, in just provide either uh, you know, profitable streaming agreements, um, strategic investments in the gold sector, and become an equitable partner. They should stay out of it. Really. <laughs> right. They really should leave it to the private sector. They have no business in investing in this sector or any sector for, for that matter. And I think there's, you know, as, as, as the gold price and other commodity, other metals go up in value, the private sector money is going to be available. So there's no need for them. So not necessary. Doesn't matter. Grant, Rick, anything you'd add on that? I, I mean, I think it's a lovely idea. Jay Martin for Prime Minister. It worked for me. But. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, let's, um, let's for a minute. So I just want to revisit one thing we've talked about just because I, I feel it's very important to hammer this. Uh, the secure end of the barbell. Another thing this does for you, holding physical gold, holding an abundance of cash, it gives you the option to be patient. It's hard to be patient when everything you have is on the table. And I think that's largely been fueling the FOMO investment trend that we've seen for the last decade because if everything you have is in the spec market, whether that's broad sector equities, that's still speculative growth, countries that have no plans to become profitable, that's speculation. If everything you have is in those assets, then you always feel a bit reactive, right? You're always going to be triggered into fight or flight, think short term, and react instead of proactively do something. The benefit of having that safe haven end of the barbell buffed out with whatever you need it to be, whether that's real estate, cash, or gold, it gives you the option to sit back and watch a crisis unfold and not lose your mind, not be triggered into fight or flight. And maybe that's when we get to the uh, fear of screwing up cycle that's maybe coming next. Yeah, I, I think um, the, the biggest mispricing in financial markets is the median investor's pricing of their own risk tolerance versus their actual risk tolerance. People think, oh, I can handle risk, I'm going to be fine. And, and they make decisions based on a completely false understanding of their ability to tolerate risk. Um, and, you know, guys like me and guys like Rick have learned that over the years, and it's a really painful lesson when you realize the risk you can tolerate versus the risk you like to think you can. But once you get comfortable with that, it frees you up to invest in things and be wrong. And being wrong is, is such a huge part of investing. Being able to be wrong, and not only being able to handle it mentally, but being able to stay in the investment through the period where you're wrong. And then having the ability, if you're wrong for a long time, and you realize there's a fundamental reason why you're wrong, you've got something wrong going in, having the humility to cut it. And these are the, the, the biggest problems that I think all of us have are all in here. It's just understanding ourselves understanding our character, understanding what we're capable of and what we're not capable of, mm. and, and, and being humble, and being able to say, man, I screwed this up, I need to get out of this, and it's going to be painful as hell, but I live to fight another day. And so I think, um, unfortunately, what's happened over these last two decades, really, is that mispricing between perception of risk tolerance and actual risk tolerance has been reinforced by the you know, constant interventions of central banks and this buy the dip working every time and, uh, you know, people go, oh my God, the market's going down. Oh, look, it bounced and I'm right and I was right all along. And we need to forget all that. We need to really go back to first principles, sit down and think, okay, the world's changed. I need to understand what those changes mean to my investment style. And if your investment style is spray money at every idea that you get given, mm -hmm. I would suggest to you that you need to rethink that because it's not going to work. You know, just, I don't want to steal too much time, but a quick story. A friend of mine told me about a neighbor of his who, uh, this friend of mine is a, is a money manager and, and a very good one, and his neighbor, who 
was just a businessman, and he, he would often, over the garden fence, he would say, oh, I've been given this great tip in such and such a stock, and I'm going to put 20 grand in this, and I'm, someone's given me a tip in this, and I'm putting 10 grand in that. And then one day he came to my friend and said, hey, um, this guy, this friend of mine is opening a dry cleaning store in town, and he wants me to be his investment partner. And the guy then chewed my friend's ear off for 20 minutes. He, he said, you know, I've been around, and there's only two dry cleaners in... 20 miles of here and you know I've looked at the footfall and those things and he wasn't just buying a ticker he wasn't buying a three letter acronym putting money into a stock tip he was investing in a business and the amount of work he did same money the guy wanted 20 grand the amount of extra work he did to invest in a business was ridiculous and that's what we've gotten away from and that's what we need to go back to thank you Pass those applause on to my friend. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I, I like where this panel has landed because, um, you know, the metals market is, is heating up right now, right? And the biggest indicator of that is that there are three times as many people at this year's conference than there were last year. We had just shy of 2,000 people last year. We have 6,000 people registered this year. What does that tell you about sentiment? And, and sentiment just means more people are here looking to allocate capital, Capital will hit the sector, prices will go up. But even if we're in a, a secular bull market in commodities, a super cycle, it's going to happen in stages and there will be pullbacks. And as I shared this morning, I know people who added a zero to their net worth in the 2020 gold market and then gave it all back in 2022. And we're not going to do that, all right? And that's why I like where this conversation has trended. Having said that, I now want to talk about offense. We spent the last 30 minutes talking about defense. So where can we look for upside? And feel free to talk your book. Uh, Frank, I, I, I want to hear about Eris and what your team is building over there uh, because it's rare you get an opportunity to invest in entrepreneurs like Frank Juster. You have one now. It's worth hearing about. Uh, but talk your book. Where are you looking for upside in the market? Frank, I'll start with you. My strategy, the way I approach making money, the offensive part of, of my business is different than Rick's. Rick has the discipline to look at almost every deal out there and be able to assess it. I don't have that kind of discipline. Mm -hmm. So for the last 20 years, my approach has been to back incredible management teams and build a gold mining company. And I'm on my fourth at the moment. We did Gold Corp in the early 2000s, Endeavor Mining in 2009, and Leia Gold, which is now part of Equinox. 2016, and I started Eris a couple of years ago. Same team that I worked with at, en at Endeavor Mining, Ian Telfer from Gold Corp. And again, the strategy is very simple. Take three to seven years, build a gold mining company that will produce a million ounces a year. That's always the goal. And so we have a company that is you know, only less than $500 million US market cap, but it's already producing 250,000 ounces a year. It has $85 million a year free cash flow. It's got a pathway to 600,000 ounces from what we have already on our book with some really amazing world-class mining projects. And we're two years into it. So I'm hoping to catch this wave, this gold market, um, and we'll be building it as we go through this market. And that's, you focus on one thing, you do it right, and you you have patience because you go through difficult times. It's, it's never easy to build these things. It takes a lot of work. It's a buy, buy and build strategy, and it works for me. So Eris is my current company, and that's my absolute focus in the gold mining sector, although I'm still a shareholder of Equinox from my Leo Gold days, but my focus is Eris. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Grant, over to you. I'll just say, Frank, it's really interesting what you said there because... Um, yeah, at the beginning of that, you talked about how you were taking a five to seven year view on Eris. And what's interesting for people who want to invest in these things, the share price is going to be incredibly volatile during those five to seven years. But there are, you as a business owner, you have that seven year time horizon and you want to be somewhere in the seven years. There are a lot of people that buy the stock because they look at your track record and go, Frank's someone I can trust to do a good job building a business. They're going to check the share price every single day and they're going to suffer all the emotional volatility. And, and getting your time horizon aligned with the business is so important. You know, you just said something very interesting. As I, some friends of mine bought Eris a while back when it was still mostly concept. We were just, we only had one mining operation at the time. 
And I, you know, and then they watched, you know, the price of gold go up and go down, and the chair price go down by almost 50 percent. And I said to them, I wish, you know, you have to look at this as it were, as if it were a private company. Stop looking at the share price. Share price is irrelevant because we're building a gold mining company, and its day will come. If you look at the share price every day, you, it's torture. You're going to torture yourself. So I, I try not, you know, when the share price is down, it's down. It, we're still building the gold mining company, and it will get built. And yeah, you have to get into that mindset. Well, that's what we were speaking about earlier, swing traders essentially identifying as investors. What are you investing in? Is it the company or the share price? And they're two very different things. Understanding what kind of investor you are is probably the most important decision you can make as an investor. And uh, you know, one way to get there is to determine how much time do you have to invest in being an investor. And if it's two hours a day, probably shouldn't be a trader. It's probably not enough time. Um, Grant, over, you, over to you though. Where do you look for upside? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I'm exactly as Frank said, I'm playing defense right now hard because I just don't see uh, easy wins in the markets right now. Um, but I think um, I'm investing in myself, my own business, because I think that's, a, as Rick said, it's, that's, that's the best use of your time you can do. But I've got, you know, small private credit deals that I will invest in with people I know and trust and I understand the businesses. Um, and of course, the advantage of dealing in private credit is you, there's no mark to market. You don't have to worry about it. You just got to worry that the credit's good. Um, so I th again, you know, I, th I think that the days of the stock market casino and the Reddit crowd and all that stuff, they're, they're coming back again now because we're, we're in another one of these kind of frothy periods. But I, I just, I keep banging on about this and I, I, I get bored listening to myself. But I think the, the biggest investment we can all make right now today is, is taking responsibility for ourselves, our capital, and realize that, that savings are irreplaceable. And if you've been invested in the market for the last 10 years, you already got rich, unless you were 100% in junior miners, obviously. But if you've been invested, you got rich. And this is now the point, to Jay's point earlier, to stay rich. So it's really hard to make money in the markets but, and giving it back once you've made it is the cardinal sin. So it's okay to not swing for the fences until you see a great opportunity. And for me, as I say, I've, I'm heavily in cash and gold and, and um, uh, two-year treasuries because I'm happy to get paid a little bit to wait and private credit. I've, I don't have a dime in the stock market right now, mm. but I'm very liquid and I'm very happy there are a bunch of companies that I've looked at, uh, particularly in Europe, not particularly in the US, that if they get to certain levels, I will happily buy them. And I won't lose a day's sleep if they go down from there, because I understand what I'm buying and the level I'm buying it. And that, to me, is arguably the most important thing, that, that confidence that you know the company and you're happy with the price. Got it. Thank you, Grant. Rick, over to you. Where are you hunting for upside? Are you? I'm defensive in a sense, but I'm overly liquid. Um, which doesn't actually feel bad. Uh, I would like to be a bit more aggressive. Uh, I suspect that I'll get my opportunity. I, I expect that the, uh, you know, that there'll be some sort of panic or there'll be some sort of volatility that causes other people to panic and allows me to deploy. I had thought that the junior mining industry as a group would sort of run out of capital in last year uh, and eventually they'd have to come to Uncle Rick and give me a warrant. Uh, I played chicken with the market. The financing window is open, and it turns out that Uncle Rick at 70 is irrelevant. Um, I will have my time. Uh, and one of the beautiful things, really, about having some patience and having cash is that when the opportunity comes, I'll be there. So my suspicion is that I will be able to be aggressive, as I have in the last 30 years, mostly when other people are afraid. And I don't think people are quite afraid enough yet. Actually, Jay, can, can I have one more thing we haven't, we haven't spoken about? And that is, that is uh, leverage. Leverage, leverage, leverage. Because leverage has been king for a long, long time now. And in the environment we're in now, whatever you're going to do, don't think that leverage is going to be your friend anymore and go wild with it. Because it, that's, that's the guaranteed way to the poorhouse in the environment we're in right now. I'm, I'm going to need you to expand on that now. Uh, no, no, I, I somebody just Somebody loves it, yeah? We've but, been able to borrow and borrow But you're borrow right, because this is a tectonic shift, right? So Exactly right. And so even though people are talking about rates are going to come back down again, the Fed's going to pivot, et cetera, et cetera, 
the days that you can rely on them going back to zero and be able to roll over any funding you have at zero, they're gone. Forget it. Doesn't matter if they start trending that way. You cannot comfortably sit with leverage and assume that you're going to be able to roll it over. Mm. Um, and we're going to see that. We're going to see that writ large in the stock market in the next two years. There are several trillion dollars that need rolling over. And right now in the high yield space, they're going to be rolling over at three times the, lev the, the, the interest rates that they're paying already. And that's not going to work. So just, just, it's not that you can't use leverage. You've got to be very careful and judicious with it mm -hmm. and use it in the right place and to the right level. Rick, what do you want to add on to that? You see me smiling, shameless self-promotion. The, uh, the only caveat to that is that if you happen to own physical gold and silver in segregated storage in the United States or Canada, Battle Bank will lend you money against your physical gold and silver. Thank you for banking with Rick. <laughs> shameless, I know. Shameless. <laughs> Frank, anything else you'd add to that? On leverage? Yeah. No, I, I, I've never believed in I, I just don't believe in leverage. I think leverage is what gets you into trouble. I've seen too many people mm. get their timing wrong and get wiped out. I just don't believe in it. And uh, you saw it in the last few years with crypto. I mean, that to yeah. me, that was utter insanity. It's, you know, putting leverage on crypto is like stuffing the Hindenburg into the Titanic. It's just, <laughs> to me, it was just <laughs> the craziest thing. And now you're seeing the unwinding of that. And, you know, just, um, you know, we've gone through this period of time where people had this casino mentality. I, you know, I just, I've, we've seen it a few times. One of the perks of being a dinosaur, like Rick and I, is that you've seen this a few times. You've seen the, 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 the attitudes, the, the, the craziness, all the stupidity, and you sit back and you kind of giggle and you go, well, this is going to end badly <laughs> for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, this whole leverage thing was just, you know, I just, I stay away from that stuff. Yeah, I'm glad we bolted that on to the end. That was valuable. Thank you. Look, this has been great. Super fun. Thanks so much for joining me on stage and getting in front of my audience tonight. I appreciate it. How do we do? Thank you, Jay. This is Jay Martin.